Well, welcome everybody to the Aquatic Sciences uh, session of the KGML Workshop. I'm Paul Hansen from the University of Wisconsin, and along with my uh, colleague Hillary Dugan, also from the University of Wisconsin, will be co-chairing this session. On behalf of Hillary and all the people who put a lot of hard work into making this uh, workshop happen, thank you uh, for coming and joining us this afternoon. And a big uh, thank you to our presenters as well. They're listed here on the screen. Uh, this is the order in which uh, you'll see the talks today. We've got a diversity of perspectives and some really great talks lined up. We'll go straight through talks until three o'clock this afternoon, uh, at which time we'll take a short 10 minute break and we'll resume uh, at 3.10 and continue on till uh, 4.10, at which time we'll have a panel discussion where we uh, clean up some of the unanswered questions. Um, the format of the talks will be pretty standard for our field. Each one is about a 20 minute slot. Uh, holding a little bit of room at the end of each talk, uh, hopefully for some Q&A. A reminder that uh, questions are done by a Slido. So it's a very easy technology to use. Please ask questions, please uh, connect and get in there. Uh, we're looking forward to a really vibrant, uh, not only set of, dis uh, of talks, but a vibrant discussion as well. A few thoughts about uh, KGML from an uh, aquatic ecologist perspective. Um, for those of us who began uh, working with uh, Bipin Kumar and his group a few years ago, this was one of those rare and uh, treasured aha moments for us. Um, it was an aha moment when we learned that decades of hard research uh, or hard work we put into our research that's instantiated in the models that we use to model our ecosystems wasn't going to be replaced uh, by machine learning. Uh, but in fact, had something to give to machine learning, to make machine learning even better. And indeed uh, gave us access to the most contemporary machine learning that is uh, deep learning that typically we don't have enough data to use uh, within our field. And so by combining uh, the knowledge and uh, machine learning, uh, we can do better than either one of those in terms of model performance. The predictions are better, uh, predictions uh, outside of sample uh, are better. We can uh, conform to physical laws and uh, ecological principles that we think are important. And from an ecologist perspective, um, it's really uh, important to feed back to our knowledge of the system. So we've also learned that uh, we can learn things about our model and therefore about the underlying uh, theory uh, that goes into those models. Uh, you're going to hear a lot about water quality today. So uh, why water quality? Our, all of our futures depend on water quality. The sustainability of the planet depends on uh, fresh water and its, uh, its availability. We do know that water quality is diminishing globally, but we've kind of a poor quantification of the state of ecosystems around the globe. And we just are beginning to understand what, especially at broad space and time scales, is affecting changes in water quality. Most of the estimates that we have of uh, water quality are empirical in nature and from statistical models at broad space and time scales. Um, and yet we have a lot of rich information about, eco uh, about ecosystems and we've devel developed a lot of process-based and physical models too, but they tend to be applied at the local level. And why is this a particularly good uh, problem for KGML? Well, there are a lot of lakes in the world. In the US, there are about 7 million lakes. And across the globe, there are about 120 million lakes. But uh, not very many of these systems actually have data. The data are sparse. They're highly heterogeneous. Uh, and they conform pretty much to a power distribution, which means that a few of the lakes have almost all the data. And most lakes have very little data at all. Uh, water quality uh, in lakes is an emergent property of ecosystems. It derives from the interactions of the physics and the chemistry and the biology of the systems, external controls and internal feedbacks. They're space and time scale dependent. And so that makes them really challenging uh, to predict for process models or for um, black box models as well. And of course, uh, we're always looking for an evolution of methods uh, that maps uh, onto the available resources uh, um, or the resources that become available to us. KGML sits uh, in a programmatic sense within the broader topic of harnessing the data revolution. And I've uh, listed here on, on the screen a number of uh, features of uh, the harnessing the data revolution that include human resources right over to research. Um, you'll hear some talks today that talk specifically about uh, process modeling and machine learning and KGML. 
but KGML is pretty new to our field. And so uh, some of the talks today will deal with other aspects um, of harnessing the data revolution. The important thing to remember is that um, these diversity of ideas and diversity of input um, should inspire, I think, more questions than we have answers. And so there are great opportunities here uh, to think about the ways we all may collaborate on, on some of these issues. I'm going to switch gears and give you a specific example of the implementation of KGML uh, in a lake, uh, Lake Mendota, Wisconsin, which is in Madison. And it's a pretty simple example. Uh, it, um, it models lake phosphorus. Phosphorus is a limiting nutrient for primary production in lakes and is responsible at high concentrations for harmful algal blooms and other water quality problems. This um, bar that you see at the top is a picture of the surface of Lake Mendota, which is covered in uh, a scum of algae. And uh, even though we know a lot about phosphorus dynamics in lakes, we really haven't done much prediction over scales that range from the short time scale, let's say days, up to decades. And so we thought we'd give that a go. And so our goal here was to improve predictions over these broad time scales in this lake. And we used three different approaches process only model, recurrent neural network, and then of course combining those two uh, to create uh, the KGML. The process model was a very typical approach that we would use in uh, modeling biogeochemistry in a lake. Uh, this is a schematic of a lake um, uh, during the summertime when it's thermally stratified. The upper layer of the lake is warm. It's called the uplimnion. It's where uh, we would swim. The uh, lower um, layer in the lake is called the hypolimnion. It's cold. And when it becomes uh, uh, anoxic, it um, is a place where cold water fish species uh, end up dying. And uh, the third layer in the system here is the sediments. So phosphorus comes in from the catchment. It is processed within the lake. Some of it is stored, some of it's recycled, some of it's exported downstream. And our goal is to try to understand um, those dynamics. So we have a process model, but we also have uh, the machine learning only model. In this case, it's a recurrent neural network. It takes the observational data, all these different time series, runs them through the RNN and make a set of predictions. Pretty straightforward from a machine learning perspective. What makes it KGML is we take the output of the process model and we provide it as another input for the recurrent neural network. But also, we enforce an ecological principle on, um, on the right-hand side here of the, the objective function or the loss function as the model uh, tries to fit the data. The ecological principle we're enforcing here is called negative one log-log scaling. Um, it's very common to uh, environmental data that most of the power is in long time scales and there's less power in short time scales. This power distribution then is enforced um, within this modeling paradigm to make sure the predictions from the neural network create a power distribution that's pretty similar to uh, what we have in the observational data. So let's go straight to the results. So uh, we have three different rows of results here. The top row is the process only, the middle row is recurrent neural network only, and then the bottom row is the KGML. Um, this uh, black line uh, is the observational data in all the different plots, and it's the signal we're trying to recreate. Uh, phosphorus in Lake Mendota is highly dynamic with a very strong uh, annual signal to it. It's highest in the winter, it's lowest in the summer. We're particularly interested in predicting summer value as well, because that's when harmful algal blooms uh, occur. The process only model does a pretty good job of capturing the annual dynamics in the system, but it misses some of these high events early in the time series. And then decades later, misses some of the lower events. This doesn't look like much, but this turns out to be a significant uh, miss on the predictions. The recurrent neural network does a better job uh, than the process model by quite a bit, actually. Um, but you'll see a lot of high frequency jitter in the recurrent neural network um, and values that when you look at them closely, uh, don't uh, represent realistic changes in the system. Naturally, the uh, PGML uh, gives us the best predictions. Um, it's a little bit hard to see and appreciate here, and I think it's demonstrated a little bit uh, better on the right side, even though these are uh, statistically significant better results on the left. On the right, we have the seasonal time series for winter and summer over the 20 years. And the process only model 
does a pretty good job of getting some of the time dynamics, but look, it missed entirely the long-term trend uh, that's in the system, both true for summer and winter. The recurrent neural network did a better job of picking up the long-term trend, although it didn't quite get it here, but uh, definitely missed some of the important changes we're seeing in summer over uh, the two decades. And the PGRNN or the KGML approach um, pretty much nailed uh, the long-term trend and gave us the best dynamics in the system. So what did we learn? Uh, this is my last slide here wrapping up. Uh, KGML provided feedback on the ecosystem process. Although I didn't show these results, uh, the process model was the most important predictor for uh, the KGML paradigm. However, it did downweight it by about 20% and reassigned some of the variants we thought should go to process into temperature. So we learned something about our model that maybe we didn't even have uh, exactly the right model and we could make some changes there. KGML was the most accurate in making its predictions. And it also gave us some information about uh, some of our next steps uh, that uh, you'll hear a little bit about in some of the other presentations. But I think uh, the, the final take home point I wanna make is we've learned a lot through this process and through our collaborations with our colleagues in computer science. And there's huge room for development and act application of KGML uh, framework for, for all of us. It's a really exciting time uh, to be in uh, the aquatic sciences. Uh, so thank you and we'll switch over to Robert.